And there's this phenomenon that people talk about with social media, FOMO, the fear of missing out. And so if something seems really big on social media, people are going to want to do that, even if only so they can post it on their Instagram. Welcome to the Torpreneur Podcast. Travel industry veteran Shane Whaley will take you on a journey with fellow torpreneurs, sharing their tips, ideas, insights, and success stories to inspire you to make your tour business the best it can be. And now, please welcome your host, Shane. Today's guest is Jeremy Wilcox. He is a New York City licensed tour guide, small business owner, and a New York native. He also serves on the board of the Guides Association of New York City, which is one of the oldest and most active tour guide associations in the US. He specializes in the the off-the-beaten-path walking tours for those looking to explore the oft-missed parts of New York City. So we really dig into his tours, why he built them, why he's passionate about them. We talk about how he got started. And in fact, he had a really cool story about, you know, some of us go to a book club. He started a walking club where they would hit certain neighborhoods and he would give his friends a, a guided tour. That's before that he went into his business. And that was the catalyst. His friends said, you're really talented at this. This is what you should do. We talk about the important support of family and friends how his spouse helped him uh, fund the business when he got started. We talk about how important his guide association of New York City is, the importance of networking. And we also talk quite a lot about Instagram and how Instagram has been a bit of a game changer for his business. And he gives us some tips around that. We also talk about the OTAs. I know I was really curious to learn how he's getting his tours discovered because he's an off the beaten path walking tour. So we dig into that as well. And I have a live little search online to see how the OTAs are helping or hindering Jeremy's business. So without further ado, I say that every week, don't I? Let's cross over to Jeremy Wilcox. (laughs) Welcome to Tourpreneur, Jeremy Wilcox. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Really interested to talk to you today because you're wearing two hats, as it were. You are a tourpreneur. You are the entrepreneur behind Custom NYC Tours, and I definitely want to find out more about your business. But you are also a board member at the Guides Association of New York City. So I'd love to find out a bit more about your work there and about what you guys are doing at the association as well. Maybe we can start off with what came first, Custom NYC Tours or the Guides Association? They both kind of came up around the same time, very shortly after I started my business. Being so new to the business, I realized I should meet other tour guides and network and just learn from them. So I did a Google search for New York City tour guides and found the Guides Association, joined very shortly after, started attending a lot of their meetings. And I've always tended to be someone that when I find an organization like that, I get involved, like really involved. So I started volunteering for committees, helping organize events for them. And within just under two years after joining, I'd been elected to their board. So I tend to really go all in with these things. Just help me with the timeline. So you became a guide first. Was that for your own business or were you working with other companies? Yes, I became a guide first before joining the association, but I became a member of the association within six months of getting my New York City sightseeing license. And I've always sort of worked for myself. That was one thing that I had said from the beginning that I didn't really want to work for other companies. I didn't necessarily have the best experiences in my previous work before I became a tour guide. I kind of just wanted to see what would happen if I went out on my own. And that's more or less worked out so far. So I think I made the right call. Okay. So you built Custom NYC Tours first, and then I'm still a little confused with the timeline. So you went and became a licensed guide, and then you started your business said from day one, I'm not going to work for anyone else. I'm going to work for myself. Right. So the basic timeline is early 2016, I got my sightseeing guides license. And then I immediately founded my company, Custom NYC Tours. For the first month or two, obviously, that was a lot of figuring out what the company was going to be, planning out tours. Then a few months after that, I found the association, uh, joined them, and through meeting them, meeting other tour guides, it gave me a better idea of what other people did and therefore what I wanted to do. I understand. So let's talk about Custom NYC Tours. So 
you got your certification, you were ready to go. How did you then go about, what were the first steps in building your business? So the first steps were coming up with a name and a concept. I mean, there are so many tour companies in New York City, many of them wonderful. And so I thought, if I'm going to go into business for myself, found my own tour company, what am I offering that these other companies can't offer? Because if I'm just offering the same thing as them, I'm just saturating the market more. The idea was I would offer small group walking tours, usually a maximum at most of 15. Usually in some tours, it's even smaller. So that would get away from a lot of those big group tours that you see all over the place. I think a lot of people were looking for that type of experience. And also the idea of providing custom tours. There's a lot of very niche tour companies, gangster tours, food tours, all wonderful. What I said my niche is going to be is everything. I was sort of, I guess, humble bragging that my knowledge of New York City was so extensive that you could name me any neighborhood in New York City or any aspect of New York City history or culture, and I could plan a tour around that. Wow. So that's what I wanted custom NYC tours to be. Any tour you could think of, and they would always be guaranteed to be small and intimate groups. Did you launch with one tour or did you have a basket of tours that people could choose from from day one? How did that look like for you? I started out with three tours that I had created and it's grown since. First three tours I had created were a Brooklyn street art tour. That is a passion of mine. A World's Fair history tour in Flushing Meadows and tour of my own neighborhood, Flatbush, Brooklyn, and more about the history and architecture of this neighborhood. And then I sort of starting out with some of those and meeting other both guides, but also a lot of tourists sort of learning about what they wanted to see and adding more tours based on, well, like, what are the areas that people seem most interested in? Yeah. And how did you go about getting that research? How did you know, right, I'm going to create these three tours because there's demand for it rather than I'm going to build these tours because I'm passionate about them? It was actually more the latter at first. I thought these are tours that I'm explicitly passionate about. I thought that they were tours that people would be interested in. And I said, I'll sort of figure out if the demand is there later. And you sort of learn, you come up with some ideas for tours where you realize the demand is not as strong as you think. But so I started from my own passions and then kind of actually worked backwards from there, learning about what people were interested in. The main tour I do several times a week is now a Central Park walking tour which was not in my original roster, but I learned that people were really actually kind of desperate to take a tour of the park that was different, more about the history and the landscaping architecture than that aspect of the park's history. So listening to the guests I would get on my earlier tours and creating tours based on what they said they felt was missing from the tour offerings in the city. Yeah, I kind of wish I'd taken that tour because I'd left New York City by 2016, but I, I run around Central Park many, many times and I'm a history buff. I'm pretty sure I've run past some pretty interesting landmarks and just, you know, I've got my iPod headphones in, iPod, that ages me, iPhone headphones in <laughs> and run around Central Park. There's probably a lot I would have uh, enjoyed learning about. So maybe next time in town, I'll, I'll take that with you, Jeremy. You're welcome. Want to connect with other tourpreneurs? Then join our Facebook group at tourpreneur.com forward slash Facebook. So you've come up with the three tours. How did you go about getting the word out that these tours were available? So I created my own website. I set up social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And then I take, even before I became a tour guide, I've always taken a lot of photos around the city. So I just posted, even when I started my Instagram, you know, dozens of photos right away of like, this is New York City through my eyes and trying to give people a preview of the type of areas they would see if they hired me to be their guide. And so a lot of word of mouth, And obviously then realizing early on that you kind of need to partner with some of these third-party sites like Viator, now TripAdvisor Experiences, some of these other places where you list your tours and they kind of do a lot of the promotion for you. Now they obviously take their commission, but you know, it's sort of worth it in terms of what they provide you in terms of exposure that your own website won't give you. And how much of your business would you say proportionally is coming from the likes of Viator? I would say at this point, it's probably actually more than half, somewhere around 55, 60% uh, some years. So I am getting most of my business through some of those third-party sites, which is fine. They give you you know, good exposure. The commission is reasonable. 
and then do those sort of public tours for them while also saving about half of my schedule to do private and custom tours, which I obviously were originally going to be the focus of my business. So you've got your tours listed. We'll, we'll use TripAdvisor experiences for now. So you've got your tours listed there. So what tips have you got for other companies who are out there that may be you know, for instance, when I go to an OTA site, generally I see, you know, Statue of Liberty cruises or One World Observatory or Top of the Rock. It's kind of those well-known products that are at the top. What are they doing to promote your tour to people who don't know you exist? I think it's, you really got to know how to word it so that it sounds differently. But the main thing I think that's helped me is just really good reviews, which are, you know, word of mouth, like you can look up, say, my Central Park tour. There's a lot of Central Park walking tours on these sites. What makes mine stand out is you could see, oh, he's got so many reviews. And the thing I think that also helps me is that when you read the reviews for my tours, most of them mention me by name. And so it's not just, this was a good tour of Central Park. Well, there's a lot of very good tours of Central Park. They mention Jeremy. I spent time in Central Park with Jeremy and it was a wonderful experience. That to me, if I were reading that, I would say, oh, this is going to be reliably the same guy. This is not just a company that's sending out whatever guy that they have on hand that day. You know you're going to get this person who these other reviewers are talking about. And the fact that they remembered the guy's name enough to mention it in the review tells me that this was a very personal and memorable experience. So I think in that regards, it's a little bit subtle, but I do think that that stands out in people's minds versus like, oh, look how this clearly seems like a much more personal experience than these other products. Yeah, I understand that. I guess where I'm struggling a little bit, for instance, is if I type in, so I'm talking about discovery here, right? Because this is the key thing. If we want to grow our tour operator businesses, like we have to be people are able to find us, particularly those tours that people may not know exist. So if I put into Google, for instance, walking tour Central Park, I get centralparkdiscovery.com, I get bike tour Central Park, and then I get tripadvisor.com. But when I click that TripAdvisor link, that takes me directly into Manhattan and beyond tours, the Central Park walking tour. So that's taken me directly into one walking tour. I don't know how they've picked that one above everyone else, because I would expect that it would lead me to a page where there are several and I can pick the one I want. And then if I come out of that, the next one down is via tour and I click that link. And this is one of my frustrations and regular listeners know I used to work at Get Your Guide. So I used to see this a lot. So under the Central Park tours, I get Empire State Building tickets, NYC One World Observatory ticket, Statue of Liberty tour, okay, a one-day guided sightseeing tour, 9-11 Memorial Museum, Big Bus New York Hop On Hop Off tour. Like none of these are going directly to walking tours in Central Park. Yeah, that is something that I've actually tried to bring up to these sites before, and they seem increasingly not responsive, is that their search sort of algorithm is not very precise. And what I was more or less told and was that, oh, it used to be very, very precise, very, very precise. Nowadays, they'll just be straight up honest with you if you ask them directly. They're going to direct their customers to the tours that sell the most, whether they're relevant to the search or not, because then they get a greater commission from their business end. I totally get that. But for example, if you go to the actual Central Park page on TripAdvisor, there is a link where you can click and say, here are ways to experience Central Park, and they'll have a listing of tours. Some of them, as you noted, are not necessarily as relevant, but mine would show up in there. And I believe what makes mine stand out is the reviews. But a better example of how I sort of used recognizing how to use search to my advantage Earlier this year, the Hudson Yards development, the first phase of it anyway, sort of opened up to the public, the shopping center, the vessel, these new buildings that are there. Doing Highline tours from the beginning, I was watching this development go up and I said, you know, when this opens, there's going to be demand for people to want to take tours of this Hudson Yards development. So I said, I want to make sure that I'm the first person out there with those tours. So even before it was completed, Back when it was still a construction site, I set up on my website a tour that would be partially of the High Line and partially of Hudson Yards. So knowing that that tour would be out there over a year before the construction was even completed, so that by the time it was completed, when people would do a Google search for Hudson Yards tours, 
mine would come up in the first page of results because it had been there so long in Google and was already an established search. And that's actually been very beneficial to me in the past year since Hudson Yards opened is getting a lot of tours of Hudson Yards because I made sure to be the first one sort of on the map there offering such a tour. I like that. Yeah, I just tapped in Hudson Yards tour and you do come up on the first page. So that's very canny strategy. You've been proactive. You've seen that going up. And I think that's something that entrepreneurs can take away from today's show for sure is to be alert to what's happening in the area. Yeah. And that's another aspect I think that makes me stand out is I go out of my way to keep up with the changes. There are some tour guides who've been at this so long that, you know, they could say, oh, when you talk about New York City in the 70s, they're like, I was there. I could tell you about that. Uh, That's something I obviously can't offer. But as a young person, I'm constantly keeping my eye out for these changes. And therefore, when I see something that my brain tells me, this is going to be a significant tourist attraction. I go out of my way to sort of get ahead of the curve in that regard. And also, I'm not a Google Ads expert, a bit more on the Facebook side, but on the Hudson Yards tour page on Google, there are no paid ads. So that's an opportunity potentially to come number one on that page because no one's doing any ads on it. Just put it out there. I also, talking about searching for the discovery of walking tours in Central Park, this is the interesting thing, just to go back a step. So for me as a consumer, you know, I might have clicked out of everything by now because TripAdvisor have taken me to one tour. They haven't given me a choice. Viator are trying to sell me One World Observatory, which is the other end of town. But when I click on Get Your Guide, in fairness to those guys, their link actually does take you to Central Park walking tours. And they have quite a few walking tours there, a night tour, an after dark tour, even a Central Park walking and yoga tour. So they seem to be doing it right, a running tour. Are you working with them at all? Yes, I just recently got started. So far, my Central Park tour I have set up with them. I will be adding some of my other tour, regular public tour offerings to get your guide. But yes, I have recently partnered with them. Great. So again, full disclosure, I used to work at Get Your Guide. That's not why I'm bringing this up. But as a consumer, this is what I want because I've typed in Central Park walking tours into Google. I don't want to see, well, as much as I love One World Observatory, that's not what I'm searching for. So I think, you know, the other OTA should be following Get Your Guide's lead here because it's very frustrating when you can't find what you want. Anyway, I, I banged on about that enough. So you built your own website. How did you go about doing that? I just sort of wanted to create a very basic website that I thought would be very easy to use, show my tour offerings, give a little bit of information about me. I really just looked up what makes a good tour website, mostly again, wanting it to be easy to use. When you land on a tour website, for instance, what do you think makes it appealing to you? For me, right away, a description of what is this company? What do they do? The menu is easy to navigate. This is not necessarily completely about tour websites. But you know, nowadays, you go to a lot of tour websites, there's stuff popping up all over the screen. You have to scroll all the way around to find the thing that you came to that website to find. And even myself as a sort of very savvy web consumer, if I go to a website like that, and it's just sort of jerking me around, I'm more likely to just to walk away. So I said, I want people to land on the website. It's very obvious what this website is, what it offers, Everything is clearly worded and the menu is clear where it even is, but it's easy to navigate. And then obviously working with Fair Partner, who's my sort of booking platform, that it's very clear how you book the tours. I mean, you'd be surprised some websites you go to and you see the tours and it's not even immediately evident how you would even go about booking it. That's obviously a turnoff for a consumer. Yeah. And in terms of the technology, so if you built this yourself, what software did you use? I was using Squarespace and I just sort of used one of their basic templates and altered it to what I wanted to use it for. One thing I made sure to do was to feature a lot of photographs and slideshows because people might say, okay, Central Park walking tour. If they've never been to Central Park before and their knowledge of it is strictly based on movies, like what are the areas that we might see? I wanted to give people visual previews of the type of places that are visited on my tours. Because I think being able to visualize what the experience is going to be is very helpful in terms of making that sale versus something that might just be text-based only. Is Squarespace a a service that you'd recommend to tour operators who are starting to build a website for themselves? Absolutely. I found their pricing to be very, very fair. Their templates are very easy to use. You don't have to be a webmaster, you know, have expertise in HTML. It's very easy to sort of customize it to however you want, change the layouts and the widths. That was what I liked about it. It seemed very intuitive 
to control versus, you know, you really didn't need to. They just made it very easy. And their customer support also is really yes, fantastic yeah. in the sense that they actually get back to you and are responding to your actual concerns. Sure, absolutely. You also talked then about social media. So you talked about Instagram. I mean, how did you learn that? Because it's not like you wake up one morning and you're a black belt in all these things, right? How did you go about learning the different channels? I mean, these were channels that I were using in my own personal life long before I became a tour guide. So I knew them very well. And just thinking from the perspective of a tourist, I also thought, well, what's the hierarchy of which social media platforms would most entice you to take a tour? I thought Instagram, again, it's visuals. I'm going to go and want to look at pictures of the type of places that they visit, maybe pictures of tours, Facebook, you know, second, uh, because people do check Facebook for events. You know, you see a list all your public tours as events there. People might come across them that way. Twitter being last, I think it's important to have a Twitter profile. I sort of knew from the beginning that really wasn't how people would be looking for tour companies, but it just was there. And also recognizing that TripAdvisor was the most important thing to set up as well. Not a social media platform per se, but obviously it's where people would be searching for tours. And again, one thing I correctly realized very early on is what would distinguish me versus other guides and tour companies was making sure that my reviews all reflected a five-star quality and the personal experience I'm looking for. Yeah. I want to dig into that in a moment, just in terms of, of social media. So again, you know, we often hear on the show, oh, we built an Instagram channel and, and we've got followers, but I know it's not that easy. I know you don't just set it and forget it, right? You have to do a lot of work. What would your tips be for your fellow tourpreneurs listening to the show today in terms of growing their Instagram account and following? One thing I would say is don't necessarily obsess on the number of followers. I mean, there's plenty of people, both personal and businesses, who buy followers or just gain followers in ways that are very artificial where, you know, okay, if you have a million followers on Instagram and none of them are purchasing your product, that's absolutely useless to you as a business owner. What you want to do is you want to make sure that your followers, the ones that you do have, they're people who are engaging with your content, the people who might say, oh, I might take this tour or even just, hey, I have a cousin or a friend who's going to New York and I keep coming across this Instagram. I'm going to recommend this company to these people. So it's you want followers who are actually engaged. And one way you can do that is knowing the right hashtags to use when you post stuff. You know, Don't just post a picture and post a nice caption. You have to use hashtags. That's more important in Instagram than in any of the other social media platforms. So think it's... You know, when you're going on Facebook, you're not looking stuff up on Facebook by hashtag. Some people do, very few people do. On Twitter, it really only applies to trending topics. I just don't get the sense that that many people are looking up hashtags on Twitter. But on Instagram, it's a regular thing. Like I look up hashtag stuff all the time. If, say, one of my regular type of tours that I offer are my street art tours. So when I'm looking for sort of new and exciting street art, I'll search in Instagram the hashtag street art nyc and sort of see what other people are posting that might lead me to discover a new piece of street art that i hadn't come across personally so people might say look up hashtag nyc architecture they might come across a photo from one of my architecture tours and that might lead them to me i just think that that is a way that people sort of work with instagram that they don't work with other sites and with my street art tours i actually set up a separate instagram page uh, street art tours nyc to specifically promote that because I realized very early on I was actually getting a good amount of customers from my street art tours who were finding my street art pictures on Instagram enough so that I actually wanted to devote a whole separate page to it because it's a very different type of New York City experience than say pictures of Central Park or skyscrapers. So just so I'm clear, so you have a main Instagram account for custom NYC tours and then you have another one for street art NYC. Yes. Clever which is Street Art Tours NYC. That one is just strictly focused on pictures of New York City street art, pictures from the tours, and just enticing people that the idea, similar to what I was talking about with some other tours, is, oh, this guy has pictures of, you know, thousands of pictures on his Instagram of just New York City street art. He clearly knows the street art scene. He knows the artists. He knows the areas. This is clearly a guy that I would hire to show me around this aspect of New York City culture. And with Instagram, 
because I'm not that up on it. I have an account. I don't post on it anywhere as much as I should. But is there an algorithm? Like the more that you post and the more likes you get, the more it gets shown in people's feeds. How does that work? Yeah, it works similar to Facebook in that regard. It used to strictly be chronological. Now there is an algorithm. The algorithm is partially based on things that other people are engaging with more. It's based on, say, if you like photos from other people you follow with certain hashtags on them, it tells Instagram, this person wants more photos with these type of hashtags. So they'll put those into your feed more. One other way that you can increase your engagements on Instagram is by using the stories feature. Because when you're using Instagram through the app, the stories are always up on top. So if you have recent stories, even if a photo of yours is lower down in the actual feed, your story will be up there near the top and that will get people engaging with your page more. Right. Maybe I should have an episode on this and and bring a few people on like yourself and we can do a whole episode on Instagram because I think it's fascinating. And I think it is an area all of us can improve because I just feel that Instagram is far more, you're right, it's far more suited for people who are searching for an experience than Twitter and, and Facebook are. And it's just become such a phenomenon in the tourism world. If you read these articles now about, you know, quote unquote, over tourism, a lot of the people talking about it actually blame Instagram because besides the fact that global travel is now more accessible economically to people, now on Instagram, you see people, some of these are just these, you know, sort of fake influencer types, but you see people taking these photos in Venice, photos in Iceland, and it's exposing people to these places that they never thought to go. Iceland is a great example, which, you know, obviously their government made a big push for tourism. But one of the things that really drew a lot of tourists over the last decade to Iceland as a destination was people seeing photos of the Blue Lagoon and the glaciers there and and that they saw on Instagram. And it looked very glamorous. And it became this thing where people wanted to get those photos. People wanted to get those exact, replicate those experiences that they saw on Instagram. And so for a lot of those places that used to be very sparse destinations that are now increasingly becoming overcrowded, the articles mention Instagram. So, well, that's obviously not necessarily great for the industry or those locations. It certainly told a lot of tour leaders and tour guides and tour companies, hey, if you really want to get exposure for your city, the locations and attractions that you're offering tours of, Instagram is the way to do it because people will see that. And there's this phenomenon that people talk about with social media, FOMO, the fear of missing out. And so if something seems really big on social media, people are going to want to do that, even if only so they can post it on their Instagram. So people could say, see, I'm just like these other people. I'm doing the big things. Yeah, absolutely. In that vein, then, have you ever considered calling one of your street art tours, for instance, the NYC Street Art Instagram Tour? Because just using that kind of marketing, and I've seen OTAs do this, that potentially could increase interest in your tours because you've called it the Instagram Tour. Yeah, that's something I have thought about, even if just these sort of one-off tours of being like, yeah, the Lower East Side... Instagram street art experience of NYC, letting people know that. And that's another term that you're seeing more often now is people don't want tours. Young people don't want tours, I should say. They want an experience. That's why Viator rebranded as TripAdvisor Experiences. That's why when Airbnb launched their tour subcompany, it's Airbnb Experiences. There's this marketing that tells them that tours are something that people associate with old people which I think is not necessarily fair, but that's the way I think they marketers think. Young people want an experience. That to them seems more exciting than true. I hear this. I don't know if I believe it. But you know, when I'm in New York City, I look up at those hop-off buses. I see a mixture of ages up there and on walking tours around downtown. So I see the data. I see the research. I'm just not fully convinced. I think there definitely is a shift towards experiences. But I still feel that for me, it's I think the key is whatever the tour is, it's about making that guest feel like an insider. You know, you have your Central Park tour, you're giving them things that they're going to go home and go, oh, did you know that, I don't know, Teddy Roosevelt was, you know, sat on this bench and whatever, wrote this speech or whatever it may be, you know, giving people the details that they're not going to necessarily hear on some of the tours that are out there, the more mainstream tours. For me, it's about making that. And I think the research bears that out. I think the experience thing comes from, right? You being feel like you've been given secrets about a place 
rather than, no, there's Statue of Liberty and there's One World Observatory. You know, you're actually getting those facts. Anyway, that's just my private view. I still feel that traditional tours are extremely popular. Right. And you know, the thing I always tell people is, you know, sometimes you get this question as a sort of tour company. It's like, well, why should I hire you? Why can't I just get a guidebook and walk around? Walking around, staring into a book half the time, you know, it's not a great way to vacation. You hire a tour guide, he's going to do all that work for you. All you've got to do is just follow and listen. You're going to discover things that's just not in any book. A lot of these books are great, but there's only so much space in them. And because New York City, more than most American cities, is so constantly changing. Yeah, absolutely. Hudson Yards being a great example of that. Honestly, by the time a lot of these guidebooks even get to print, even if they're the most current edition, they're already out of date. Restaurants have opened and closed. New entire neighborhoods have been built up. There's new skyscrapers. A live guide, particularly, I think, one such as myself, they're absolutely up to date and they're the real way to experience it. Just And that's no fault for the companies you know, to do these guidebooks. They have deadlines to publish and they can't possibly keep up with the pace of New York City. And I don't see as many people walking around New York with guidebooks in their hands as much as I used to. Yeah, I think they figure they can just look that up online. But again, do you really want to spend your whole vacation standing on a street corner, Googling stuff and looking up Google Maps and realizing that you sort of you went the wrong way? With that being said, do you feel there is a threat to tour guides from audio self-tour guides? Absolutely. Because even if it's a small percentage of people who are going to choose that over a live guide, well, you know, I'm sure you know from talking to so many tour operators, this is not a business that most people are getting rich in. They're doing it because they love it. Absolutely the case with me. And at best, you're making a decent living. You're not exactly, you know, going to get rich and retire early. So even you lose just a fraction of your customer base to that new technology, that really adds up and will over time. So that's something that I'm concerned about. So there's nothing I can do to change the pace of technology. Sort of what I think someone like myself can do to combat that is say, hey, I'm offering you a personal experience that those things can't. I'm going to be with you. You can walk through Central Park without headphones in so you can experience the sound of the birds and the sounds of the city. The other thing you can't do with the pre-recorded narration is ask it questions, ask it for clarification or say, hey, I've just finished this tour here. We're on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. What's a good place you would recommend for lunch? Pre-recorded tour app or something like that, you can't do that. Only a live local human being can provide you that experience. And so I think if anything, it just forces local guides to up their game. You can't just get by on well enough anymore. You've really got to make yourself a personal five-star experience of a human being. Definitely. You know that that's wise advice. Never miss an episode of the show. Subscribe at torpreneur.com forward slash subscribe. Getting back to you built your website, you're on top of your social media channels. Just on Instagram before I move on, are there any apps that you recommend for tourpreneurs to use? Because somebody was telling me the other day that after light I don't really use this stuff, but in terms of filters and changing colors and everything, are there any apps you use to enhance your photos? No, there's no sort of third-party apps. There are sort of built-in filters within Instagram that I've just personally found sufficient. Okay. And one obviously thing that Instagram has done besides adding the stories is now you can add a slideshow. You can do 10 pictures in one post. Oh, wow. So if you're posting photos from a tour... You can sort of post a slideshow of photos and it gives people a better experience. But there are some good sort of third-party photo editing apps out there. I've just never used them. I found that Instagram's own internal editing is sufficient enough for me. Sufficient enough. Okay, that's great. So the big question for you then, like I say, you've got your website, you've written out your tours, you've got them planned out, you're on your social media, you've got an agreement with some third-party OTAs to work with. How are you funding yourself at this stage? Just sort of all by myself, I mean... I was also very lucky to have a husband who has a, a you know full-time job. And so when I first started out, and obviously any tour guide just starting out, you're not going to be making a living off of this. So I was just very fortunate. I think this is totally fair just to point out myself that I had a husband who was like, when I first started out being like, look, if you're not making a good amount of money the first few months, don't worry about it. I can cover us. Just you know, focus on growing the business. I was very aware from the beginning that was a luxury that people who were single or whose spouses maybe didn't have the kind of job that mine does would not be able to offer. So that sort of comfort of when I was first starting saying, okay, I can just focus on creating and perfecting these tours, 
getting out that word of mouth and the fact that for the first few months, I'm not going to be making as much money as I will in a year. That's okay because, you know, my husband will support me. And luckily I did figure out a niche pretty soon and was getting steady business by the end of my first year. It's a really important point, Jeremy. And it's something that we haven't really discussed enough on the Tourpreneur Show is the support of spouses and family because Without them, I think many tour you know operators wouldn't be in business today. And that's not just financial support, but having you know a spouse who understands that you're going to have to work a lot of hours to make the business work. You've got to get out and network. You might have to do a tour late at night, you know, etc. And that's why we call the show Tourpreneur, to be honest, because tour operator I don't think fully encapsulates what you guys do because you're having to do everything from leading the tours, marketing, doing the books, your taxes, and we haven't even talked about licenses and, and insurance and stuff yet. But there is so much you have to do. Oh yeah, and make money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that- and I can't thank my friends and family enough because like it's weird. I hadn't actually had the original spark of being a tour guide. It was my friends and my husband who pushed me into it. I was working for movie memorabilia company previously. And I just found the work kind of depressing after a while. And on weekends, what I would do is I created this something called walking club. And like a book club, we would meet every month. But instead of reading a book, somebody in the group would pick a different neighborhood that they had never really knew much about. And what I would do was research that neighborhood. And then we would lead a sort of half day walk around that neighborhood. And I would explain the history, point out the landmarks. And after doing this for over a year. And then we would go out to eat afterwards and I'd complain about my job. One of my friends was like, you should quit that job that you're complaining about and do this for a living. And I'm like, no, this isn't a job. And he's like, it is. This is a thing that people make a living doing. And then my husband really gave me the push. He's like, yeah, this is amazing. You're doing all this research. You know, all these neighborhoods, you're leading all these people around for free, quit your job, take the leap. You know, I support you the whole way. And I believe that you can make a living doing this. And I did not have the confidence at first. And then I made that leap. And I'm very glad that I did because it has worked out. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's such an important point. And actually, nearly every entrepreneur we've spoken to on the podcast so far, it's been their friends that have urged them to go and take the plunge. I'm smiling here because I hear this so often. We're very blessed to have such good friends. It's part of it you take for granted. Like when I would do these walking club that I had with my friends, they'd be like, oh, it's this is so amazing. And I'm like, everybody, like we'd be walking around, say Red Hook in Brooklyn. And I'd be like, oh, everybody knows about the history of Red Hook. And they'd be like, nobody knows about the history of Red Hook other than people like you. You have a skill and a level of knowledge that is worth money and convinced me of that. And so again, very appreciative of it. And that must help you when you're leading tours that you hear that validation. Because, you know, again, a lot of tour openers talk about imposter syndrome in the early days of thinking, like, who am I to be leading this tour, et cetera. And I guess for you, you had that validation from friends and from leading the walking club. I think that's a great idea, by the way. You also had your certification from New York City as well. So I guess you were super confident that you knew what you were delivering quality information on your tours. Yeah, because, you know, I think this is somewhat rare because of that experience with what I call the walking club. I hadn't even realized at the time, but I'd been doing tour guide work, just not as a, you know, full actual paid professional. So I did have this idea, like I can do this. I just, my only concern at the beginning was I had full confidence that I knew what I was talking about. Obviously I had my license from the city. So the city of New York says that I'm qualified to do this. It just was a question of, okay, then how do I find the customers? How do I market it? I did deal a little bit with that sort of imposter syndrome at the beginning, but the long term, my main concerns have been like, okay, I fully believe that the tours I'm offering are unique and really, really stand out in this very, very saturated market. How do I get those customers to me? That's the struggle. I mean, the endless struggle is how do you market this? You can have the best tour in New York City if the customers who want to take that tour can't find you it's worthless. So let's talk about that a bit more because that's the number one question that I get from listeners is, you know, please ask your guests how they really grew their business. So looking back, what do you think were some of the big decisions you made that improved your business and got the word out there about your tours? I think at first it really was, I mean, it sounds fairly simple, TripAdvisor really going out of my way at the end of every tour to, you know, without browbeating people, like, please leave me a review because I felt that that would sell me. But I also would credit joining the Guides Association, which I did very soon after starting my business. And through them, I began networking with other guides. And sometimes they would need me to fill in on 
you know, one of their tours or a company approached them about a tour, which they couldn't do. And I started doing those. And besides more different tours, improving your skill, it also allowed me to meet other kind of tourists. So networking, I would say is important. You know, you're in an industry that's very large. You're not in a vacuum. You're not on an island unto yourself. If you're working in a city that has a lot of other tour guides, don't necessarily look at them as your competitors. Look at them as an asset. Network with them. They can help you. And then in return, you might be able to help them at some point, which I believe I have with many other guides through my work in the association. Because the more tours you're doing, the more people you're meeting, you know, that just increases that. And if you're a really good guide, what you're going to get, which for me was the ultimate validation, is when you start getting repeat customers. People who've taken one of your tours and then they come back to town and say, I want to take another one of your tours. It wasn't that say, oh, they took my Midtown architecture tour and it's just by pure coincidence the next time they wanted to see Brooklyn street art. I've had cases where customers have contacted me and say, hey, I'm coming back to New York City. I really want to take another one of your tours. What do you want to show me a tour of? Like, what do you recommend? And they're really saying that you are such a good guide that I want to experience New York City with you again. The subject matter is up to you. That's not even what's most important to me. That's really amazing because, you know, there's plenty of tour guides out there. You can also experience the city by yourself and just try and wing it. Somebody says, I want to spend time on my vacation with you again, two vacations in a row. Like that's very flattering. It is very flattering. And I want to go back to your point about working with other tour guys and other companies, because you're quite privileged there in New York City that you have, you know, various networking groups that get together and have beers and and discuss the industry. You also have the Guides Association. I'm just thinking about some of those cities around the world, some of those towns that don't have anything formal. I would suggest, and maybe this will be, we will bring you back on and talk about this on another episode Jeremy, is how people could go about building their own association, even an informal once a month or every three months for, for pizza and wine or whatever, and get to know your fellow tour guides. Because like I, say, I know New York City, San Francisco, pretty London, very well advanced when it comes to networking, but not every city is. Yeah. And that's, you know, very important. I mean, the one benefit of, say, if you're leading a tour company in a city where there isn't as much of a saturation of tour companies as there in New York is, well, that's less competition, but more ways that you could use social media, word of mouth, viral advertising to make yourself stand out. Pluses and minuses are great in New York City of being a guide. Pluses, we're the most visited city in the country. You know, we've had over 65 million visitors last year. So it's a lot of potential customers there. The downside is There's so many tour companies, and so many of them are fantastic. There is more of a struggle to figure out how to stand out. So the reverse is, in a smaller area where there's less tour companies, there's more of an opportunity to make yourself stand out. Yeah, there is. And actually, I think about it this way, that I know Arrival put out some research that on average, people go on seven different activities on every trip. And I know in a recent trip I had to Chicago, I can tell you, I think it was a Sunday We did the Chicago Architecture River Cruise, which is one of the most popular tours in the United States, if not the world. And it was a great tour, gave us a kind of broad view of Chicago. It's a fantastic tour. I can see why it gets the plaudits. And then we went and had coffee and a donut. And then we went on Margaret Hicks's tour, which was a small walking tour where we discussed the architecture on the rooftops of all the buildings in Chicago. And that was much more of a deep dive on some of those buildings. We spent a long time, you know, looking at different buildings and their history. We went inside buildings. So we had best of both worlds there where we had the more kind of, you know, helicopter view, if you will, with the the river tour. And then Margaret took us on a very intimate tour. And I would say to tourpreneurs out there that, you know, to remember that, you know, when people come into a city, they generally stay at one hotel, they've flown in with one airline, but we want to do lots of different tours. So that's why we shouldn't view everybody as, as a competitor. Another advice I would give to other tour guides and something I found invaluable myself is when you do visit other cities such as Chicago or London or Reykjavik in Iceland, take tours. Take tours that are similar to your own and get an idea of how other people do it. But also, if you're traveling with family or friends, bring them on the tours. And then afterwards, this is something I do when I travel with my husband. After We always go on a tour when we're on vacation, several usually. I say to him afterwards, okay, we're going to discuss this tour twice. We're going to discuss it immediately afterwards. And then I'm going to ask you about this again next week. What worked for you about that tour? What didn't? 
And then a week later, what I ask is, what do you remember about that tour? What is the most memorable aspects of the tour? I said, say we were in Sydney, Australia. This woman gave us a great tour of the Rocks District down there. She pointed out this old home. She mentioned the year it was built. Do you remember that? He says he doesn't. It was built for this specific British admiral. Do you remember who? He doesn't. And so that gives me as a guide, I'm like, okay, I know the stuff that people are going to remember. I know the stuff that really, really matters for the tour. The dates and names, you have to mention they're important understand that your guests are not going to remember those later. You're not going to be giving them, you know, an AP history exam after the tour. So doing tours with other people and getting their feedback afterwards is really helpful in terms of learning. What are the aspects of your tour, whether the visuals, the things you pointed out, the stories and anecdotes you told, dates, names, et cetera. What's the stuff that really made that a memorable experience? What were things that they didn't like about it? And that has, I think, made me a better guide as realizing, oh, I'm learning through the eyes of other people what they like about tours, because it's very hard when you're a guide yourself to see it from an outsider's perspective. You just can't. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. It's the best way of learning. And also getting tips from other tour guides as well, right? Just how they interact with a group. Uh, we've all got our different methods of doing that. So I totally subscribe to that view. I love going on tours, not just because of tourpreneur. I just love tours. It's why I love the industry that we are in. And I fully admit to people, even when I'm in New York City, if I'm, say, in lower Manhattan, when I'm just wandering around, I have some free time and I see a tour going on, I'll sort of sometimes like backseat drive the tour, or like watch it for 10 minutes, just to sort of see what are they doing? And this was a, not a guide I recognize, so not calling it out by name. I saw one tour in lower Manhattan once where I was waiting for a friend for lunch and the guide started out at the meeting place. And the guide stayed at that one meeting place for nearly half an hour, explaining, talking about history. And I started watching the guests. Some of them are, you know, shifting. They're starting to get bored. They're looking into their phones. And I said, oh, see, this is really good tell. When you're doing a tour like that, don't talk too much. Spread that talk out. And one thing, advice I got very early on when you're doing a walking tour, within 10 minutes, you should be moving. And so sometimes watching other tours like that, you can sort of read the customers. And that's another thing I sort of learned to do very early on is read the customers. If an aspect of the tour you could read, there's, you could see that bored look in their eye or they, when are we going to start moving? Start moving. Even if that's not what you planned, read their cues and act accordingly. If an aspect of your tour is not working, it doesn't matter if you think it's working. If they don't think it's working, it's not working. Absolutely. And there was talking about Margaret Hicks up in Chicago. She also does tour guide training and she released a couple of weeks ago. I'll, I'll add it to the show notes. It was someone she knew that is a tour guide runner. I think um, who does Chicago running tours. And she took a video of him from a distance. So you actually just look at his body language as a guide. So you can't hear what he's saying, etc. And she wrote a really cool blog post on it. So it's kind of what, what you're saying. You know, you're hanging back and just assessing. You're not necessarily listening to what they're saying, but you're looking at the body language of the tour guide, of the people in the group. So it's just fascinating. I love that kind of thing. It's really learn a lot from doing that. Did you know every weekday Shane curates the most interesting news articles in tours and activities and sends them out in a snappy daily digest? Grab your copy of the Tourpreneur Daily Briefing at www.tourpreneur.com. So we've talked about you launched your business, you got your first paying customer. What's really the most difficult situation that you've experienced and how you overcame that in your business? Difficult situations uh, vary. One thing that I didn't expect at first, I'm not necessarily sure if this is what you were sort of getting at, but sometimes you get customers on the tour who book the tour and they don't speak any English. If it's a private tour, you know, you can sort of readjust on the fly. But when it's a public tour, sometimes you get these customers who they'll say, we don't speak English. Could you speak slower or do this? And it's a public tour and you want to give them a good experience. But at the same time, you have a whole group. Another example of learning how to sort of gauge difficult customers is, you know, sometimes you'll have customers who are late. And this is a thing that you sort of learn by doing is how long should you wait? What should your policy be? Or what if customers are being difficult during a tour, how you should handle that? The president of the Guides Association, Michael Dillinger, gave me advice early on when I said about stuff like that. He's like, look, it's a numbers game. If you've got a dozen people on a tour and two of them are being difficult or two of them expect you to give the tour narration in a different way because their English is not so good, 
you've got to give the tour for the majority. It's better to have two dissatisfied customers than 10 on a tour of, say, a dozen. And so you just you do your best. Difficult situations you have sometimes where you're giving a tour, yeah, and the customers are just very difficult. They're complaining about something. You know, sometimes if the weather's not great, they'll blame you because it's too hot or it started to rain during the tour. You just got to learn how to be patient and what's the professional way to deal with that. Because I think for the other guests on that tour, that's going to give them a cue of what type of professional you are. How do you deal with the problems? If you get angry or you lash out or you react in an emotional way, that's going to affect their view of you as a professional. So just know what's the professional way to respond in situations, but also make sure that the majority of the people on the tour are getting a good experience in what they paid for. Even if this, luckily this very rarely happens, you do have to upset. A good example is I had one tour, a Central Park tour, where I had two people on a public tour who were very, very, very slow walkers to the point where we were constantly having to stop and wait for them to catch up. I realized about a quarter through the tour, we were never going to finish the tour at this rate. So at some point, I, when we had a stop, I quietly and politely pulled them aside. I said, look, I apologize. This tour does have a very set you know, route. It does have a very set pace. We're just going to keep going. I hope that you can keep up. But if you can't, I apologize. We do have to cover a lot of ground. And by about halfway the tour, they just sort of gave up and left, which I felt horribly about. But I had to ultimately look out for the majority of guests on the tour who had to get the experience they paid for. Yeah, that's really sound advice because I could imagine feeling really guilty in that situation as well. But you're right, you could look after the majority on the tour. But I guess, is there anything you could write on your website saying, you know, I don't know, you could be careful with laws, I guess, in this day and age with discrimination, but, you know, in terms of health. I do have, like, for instance, even on the third party sites like Viator, when you can add your own, like, stuff that goes in the confirmation email, like, here's the time we meet, I put stuff that I think is relevant. Like, I always say, one, please try and take public transportation because the main reason I found people were late in New York was they were taking cabs and New York City traffic is awful. So I did warn people about the traffic, but I also said, please wear comfortable shoes. The tour, you know, does involve a moderate amount of walking. And I'll sometimes even put like the tour will cover 1.8 miles of walking just so they are prepared. Certainly not discriminating saying, I don't want these type of people on the tour, but just I want people to be aware of what the tour is. So if they're on the tour, and they realize it is a problem, at least I can say, hey, I gave them the information that they needed. And I do try to go the extra mile in that regard. In terms of apps or tools that help you in your business, are there any that you rely on? None. I mean, other than the obvious social media channels or TripAdvisor. And Fair Harbor, right? For your booking. Yeah. And Fair Harbor, which is my booking platform. I mean, I guess one app I would say is, I always tell people you got to keep an eye on the weather app. That's the one app I think as a tour guide, I'm finding myself checking is because my website does say all tours are rain or shine. But I always tell people there's obvious exceptions to that. If there's going to be massive downpours and thunderstorms, you're going to get a refund. The tour is not going to operate. The tour may not always operate in the most comfortable weather, but the tour will never operate in unsafe weather. Yeah, makes sense. And I tell you, our mutual friend, Jesse, Walk on the Wild Side tours, when I took his tour, his punk tour of New York, it was absolutely hammering down. And he just led the tour. In the end, I said to him, you know what, let's call it a day. As much as I'm enjoying it, none of us want to be out in this, but he was not going to give up. It had to come from me, you know, trooper. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I always tell people that's entirely subjective. Like I've done tours in the pouring rain, probably sounds like the tour you took with Jesse. I've done tours, no storms. Uh, I've done tours when, you know, it's 99 Fahrenheit. I've done tours when it was five degrees Fahrenheit one winter. And also be clear with the customers. Always, if the conditions for the tour at the beginning aren't ideal, don't pretend otherwise. I always address the elephant in the room right away. I say, look, I know it's very hot today. I'm going to try and keep us in the shade. You need to stop and rest. Or are you feeling discomfort at any point? Let me know. I think that also helps people is if you're not ignoring it and you're addressing it up front and you're saying, look, I know this is not ideal, but we're going to do the best we can. And I will make alterations to the tour to try and improve the experience today. I think that helps as well. For instance, in the winter, here's another piece of advice I would give to people who do tours in city that like Chicago or New York or Philadelphia that have cold winters. There are these things you can buy at pharmacies, these little hand warmer packets in the winter. I buy them by the box full and I just obviously write it off then as an expense for my taxes. And I bring them onto every tour I do in the winter. And at the beginning of the tour, I hand them out. I say, I appreciate you doing a tour in the winter. A lot of people don't. 
I know it's cold. Here's some hand warmers. If you need more, let me know. And just those little acknowledging the reality of the situation and those little personal touches really, really help. That's huge. I wonder if you can get those branded. <laughs> I actually hadn't considered that, but I'm sure that you can. That'd be cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. Custom NYC tours, hand warmers. Hand warmers. And on the really hot summer days, you know, you're approaching triple digits in Fahrenheit. I do bring extra bottled water in my bag because hydrating is important. And you'd be surprised how many people don't bring water with them. So I say, hey, I'm thinking of you. You're not just a number to me. You're not just dollar signs to me. I recognize that you're a person who's on vacation and you want to have a memorable one. I'm going to go out of my way to try and go that extra mile to make it extra helpful for you. Well, I can tell why you get such good reviews because it's clear to us all on this uh, conversation today how much you do care about your guests. Um, I want to wrap up by a couple of quick questions here. Were there any books or podcasts that were really helpful to you when you were starting your business or even now sustaining your business that you think other entrepreneurs should read or listen to? Not to flatter you too much, but this podcast is helpful because learning how other tour entrepreneurs started their business is helpful. You sort of, you learn the similarities and differences, but books just, you know, read a lot of books about New York City. I mean, they could be deep dive books like the Gotham books or just basic books like, you know, one book that I bought, very simple book. There's a book about a guide to interior landmarks in New York City. And sometimes you find places you didn't know about, but it's just, it's good to have these guides. One of the things I do recommend that guides do is every year I do buy the Lonely Planet or the Fodor's Guides for New York City, not because I need to know this stuff, but because I know tourists are getting these books. And I say, what are they being told about New York City? What are the attractions they're being recommended? Staying up to date on that stuff is very important. Absolutely. What's the greatest piece of career advice, business advice that you'd like to pass on to our listeners? I think Again, good advice, like, you know, when you have large public tour groups, you have to worry about the majority more than, which luckily rarely happens one or two problematic people, but just recognize, I think the best advice I got was not every person has the luxury of taking these vacations or taking these tours. People are voluntarily giving part of their vacation money and time to you. You really have to provide them with a great experience. So don't just walk into a tour and again, just see everybody as dollar signs and as income. Recognize that these are people who are putting a big part of making their vacation memorable onto your shoulders. And that's kind of a responsibility. And to make sure that you, you know, you earn that. I mean, this is a great profession, but you really are responsible for people's memories. That's why on my website, you know, I say we make New York City memories. It's not just about checking stuff off of a bucket list. I want to be a part of your vacation memories. And I recognize how important that is. That's music to my ears. I always say to my sales teams, the people on your tours or staying in your hotels have worked all year round probably to pay for this holiday. They've been talking about it for months and months and months, you know, so let's make it the best experience that they can have. Jeremy Wilcox, thank you very much for coming on to today's show. Our listeners can find you at customnyctours.com. And I guess all your social media, yep, they're all there. So go take a look at Jeremy's Instagram feed. Is there anything we haven't covered on our chat today that you would like to address? No, not that I can think of. This has been a great pleasure. You know, I, again, I would just sort of say in my own self-promotion, I think these type of small group personal experiences are the best way to see a city. That's the best way to see a city is, you know, just get on the ground and experience it like the locals do. However best, you know, that's going to work out for you. Really, really sort of get in there and experience the city on the ground. It's nice to take some of these sort of driven tours, but you know, you've really got to get into the neighborhoods to really get the feel of a city and its people. Fantastic. And take public transportation. (laughs) Fantastic. Jeremy, thank you for your time today. You're welcome. Thanks for listening to the Torpreneur podcast. Be sure to visit torpreneur.com to join the conversation and access the show notes, including links to the resources mentioned on today's episode. This is Torpreneur.